Welcome back, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, we will be talking about women in STEM. So we have a wonderful guest here, Alexandra Riebe. Um, and I will be moderating the session with my friend, Iskander, from the Impact Team 2050. Um, so yeah, we will be also having Alexandra Riebe in, in person and Baratang Mia, CEO Girl Hype from South Africa, joining us online, as well as Francisca Neka Okeke, first female dean, Faculty of Physical Sciences at the University of Nigeria, joining us online. Ada Lovelace, Lisa Meitner, Elizabeth Blackburn, and Valentina Treshkova. Throughout centuries, women have contributed to the evolution of sciences, but only few of them made history. According to the Global Gender Gap Report 2022, prepared by the World Economic Forum, it will take another 132 years to close the, uh, to close the global gender gap. With only 28% of women currently pursuing a career in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, closing gender gaps in STEM would have a positive impact on employment. Good day, dear colleagues. I feel comfortable speaking Russian. Well, you're exactly right in saying that feeling insecure is quite common for ladies, for girls who opt for the STEM careers. Remember the Matilda effect, the systemic denial of a contribution women make to science and technology and progress in them. Let's start with some data. In fact, the female representation in the STEM areas, that's uh, science, natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, is four times lower than the representation of men. Although, of course, all the technological areas of study know lots of female names. Anna Gelman, an innovator in plutonium development, Ekaterina Feoktistova, who made a huge contribution into the creation of the nuclear shield of Russia. Marina Levitska, one of the first Russian women who was a physicist. Well, naturally, we come across lots of stereotypes um, against women who opt for STEM-related careers and education. Last year in Russia, thanks to the implementation of the national strategy for actions for the benefits of women, the Ministry of Labor initiated the reduction um, of almost uh, 360 professions that used to be banned for women. Um, that's quite impressive. So the landscape, the scene for opportunities uh, for women professionally has become so much wider and it now offers so many professions that were close to them before, especially now as we're witnessing the dramatic pace of development in these areas. Women who are underrepresented in these areas can make a very special contribution to developing science, research, and technology. And naturally, the employers, the civil society institutions should respond to this uh, by creating new initiatives and programs and projects to involve girls, women uh, into the STEM-related areas. Going back to some data again, uh, girls who opt for STEM careers and education oftentimes change their mind and revert from their in their second or third or third or fourth um, year of the university because in the first two years of their university career, women are just at the beginning of their educational 
a root. Uh, but in year three and year four, they get more alarmed, they get more anxious, because that's where you get far more focused technical disciplines to study. I mean, will I make it? Will I be able to do well to perform fine in this uh, trajectory? Where are my female role models? Where are those inspirational women I can learn from? Well, so as we were witnessing this uh, challenge jointly with the female community of Ross Adam, we started working on this. In fact, in many countries, they are now seeking to involve women in scientific research, and many pieces of research demonstrate that the engagement of women in research and their employments in these fields really impacts manifold both the technological processes and the business outcomes in these areas in these areas so within our community we make a special focus on engaging girls and women into science and technologies we have a flagmanship project called women in stem whereby we seek to provide additional support and to create a supporting environment for women to upgrade their expertise and competence and to help them overcome their anxiety and insecurity. Uh, Tatiana Terentiev, uh, uh, the deputy CEO um, of Rosatom, said in the company we are now implementing plenty of initiatives in education uh, ranging from the schools through to the universities. Well, this is very true. And as a community, as a mission, we see the creation some additional supporting environment. That is, we act or serve as an additional tool to engage girls in science and technologies. What are our operational modes? We do international mentoring sessions called Women in STEM. In fact, recently we've had a major open dialogue under ATEM Expo. In fact, we had experts from more than eight countries, and most importantly, our female students uh, represented the major Ross Adam corporate universities and institutions from 16 states. It's important that as part of this environment, we are developing a global partnership and a global interest in women because the stereotypes that are so pervasive and the cultural barriers and obstacles that are multiple these days surrender in an easier fashion uh, when we get to compare the best practices offered by different countries. And that's exactly why in all our international events, uh, we seek to have international experts and foreign experts. We are grateful to our colleagues from the Indonesian Forum, from the NATO and other forum for giving us a hand in developing this mode of interaction. This year, we're serving the female students of the universities that work with Ross Adam to understand what challenges they experience as female students of technical professions. In fact, every time I prepare for uh, our mentoring sessions, I encourage everyone to do focus groups whereby we analyze the real cross-section of feedback to understand what are the most important needs of our female students these days. In fact, the most pressing ones seem to be as follows. Having a tutor, all of them show up with the same kind of request. They complain of missing a tutor. They would benefit from having one throughout their learning process as part of the internships as uh, at technological uh, companies they would tremendously benefit from having a mentor and also grants study grants uh, stipends subsidies whatever funding is available to support them throughout their uh, learning now as we see the strong need for mentorship and in fact we have a self-standing uh, projects and women in professions not meant for females, 
our ladies can join in and uh, track the professional roots of other uh, female leaders. In fact, we bring together female leaders who talk openly, responding to any questions our female students may come up with. And in fact, they come so passionate and enthusiastic out of them because they say they're so grateful for an opportunity to see the making of the female uh, leaders who have accomplished outstanding results in the science and research uh, domain today, which makes our new points of growth uh, in our profession. So this is how we're going to continue. I think we're on the right track. My experience suggests that it is critically important to raise public awareness of STEM-related degrees and careers and to also boost the awareness of the female role models around as well as to organize the mentorship programs for women. Thank you, Alexandra, for your very insightful presentation. I found it particularly interesting because I'm a year four student at the uh, National Technical and Physics uh, Institute, uh, MEFI, and I found uh, that uh, we tend to have not a lot of girls who study in uh, STEM uh, degrees, and uh, maybe that is uh, the result of uh, the uh, doubts that uh, young women start having at uh, year three when they're not sure. To Miss Okiki. Uh, you are first female dean in one of the leading universities in Nigeria. I'm interested in your take on the following. While countless sessions have been focused on overcoming the glass ceiling, not enough of them stressed the importance of eliminating the glass cliff phenomenon. The glass cliff is the idea that um, when the company is in trouble, the female leader comes, on, comes in to save it. When women finally get the chance to prove uh, themselves in a senior role, they are handed something that is already broken and where the chance of failure are high. What would be the solution uh, to this in your opinion? And how could Zeus in power address marginalization on an institutional level? What can female leaders do if the glass cliff presents itself? And what should all of us do? to eliminate such possibility. Well, thank you very much. Uh, starting from the question, because when you look at the question, it looks like they are four in one question. What will be the solution to this? Of course, we have already know that there is this gender gap. And the first thing we have to do, the solution that gets closer to solving this is closing the gender gap amongst not only the scientists, but more in scientists, particularly in African continent. As this will go a long way in having a very powerful and positive impact on employment, because if you do close the gap, there will be no fear of handling when there is this ceiling cliff. You want to get a woman to settle the business, suddenly you can take him away when he has settled the business. That is the first solution I'm looking at. Is it possible we close the gender gap, particularly everywhere, but particularly in African continent? And for those in power, I suggest that they will address the marginalization by first instituting the, uh, something like funds, trust, scholarships, awards, then allowances for the marginalized. And again, they must see that implementation of what they have, if they institute it properly, should be implemented because most times we find ourselves having powerful or useful ideas, lofty ideas, but implementation has always eluded us. So if they see them implemented, they manage and marginalize, we be lifted somehow and to some point. And again, not only instituting this, they must be allowed to take part in some of these national programs that goes on like INEC and what have you, there are so many. But you find that in the institution, what they do is to still go to those that are not marginalized, the top ones, and select them. 
that's it, it does no good to any of the marginalized. Seek out the marginalized, get them involved in these programs, and then the funds will help them move forward ahead. It is what is common in most universities. They don't care for these marginalized ones. And then it, is, it will be very fine and good if they have guidance and counselors that will help them forge ahead. Because most times you see them, they become depressed and so they no longer concentrate on their education. So they can do something starting from the institution. And again, if the third one, addresses the fact that if the cliff presents itself, what will the female leaders do? They have a lot to do. When I say a lot, if you are given such a position, don't be too excited, either in a company or in a higher level education or whatever. Wherever you find yourself, you know that this is due to the glass cliff. And what am I to do? First of all, you must first of all try to study the condition that has been existing in there before you join. If you don't do that, it's possible. It's likely we crash. It's not right. And also, sometimes you are presented with a fat envelope of your salary. Don't be too anxious to grab the salary. Look at the risk involved. And if you are wise enough, build up your salary by adding the risk uh, whatever, do I call it money for any risk that you come up so that when it does come or you fall out, you will have nothing to cry about. So that is why I said, and then let the board that employ you or the people that employ you, first of all, let them set out your performance standard before ever you accept such, such position. It's not right for you to say, oh, I will do it, I can do it. Ask questions and know why other people did not get to that level you are about to get. I'm not even uh, quarreling or uh, arguing whether the women can do it. They can do it. But first of all, make background study of where you are getting into and what will be the expectation of yours. So that start from the beginning to say, oh, your expectation is too much for me or it is not too much, I can do it. And then if you do it, be confident in yourself. Confident in yourself. Don't think that when you say no, everything will fall apart. No, it will not fall apart. And then, when you are in that position, when finally you accept the position, please, you have to work with confidence and let people around you, not only in that your small circle company or industry or university, let people around you. Don't let them. Talk, uh, don't hear what they say about you, the good things. No, let them see how you can make the place and make them better. That's a very good approach for a good leader. So another one is that trust in ourselves. Be confident in yourself. That's self-integrity, that's self ego Not boasting, not pride, but then when you know where you're heading to, I don't think anybody can stop you. It is only when you have doubts in yourself that things might go up wrong. So try to avoid it. When you believe in yourself, you are there. Then again is, don't be afraid. When maybe along the line, I've worked in this company, I've worked with this university, I've worked in this industry, but you can see things moving on well as well, moving on well as well as you have. You have planned. Walk away. Doesn't matter. You can get a job anyway. And you don't allow people to walk you out. You better walk out yourself because you have already noticed if you have made the wires you're supposed to make that something is wrong here. And that is why I'm here. If you promise yourself, yes, I can fix it, go ahead and tell them that, yes, a woman is also to be heard and not only to be seen. As the society tells that a woman is to be seen not to be So we not just making much noise, you fix that place and take that goal. But what I don't like is when the place is now fixed, then the woman be set up, they keep it, will be kept aside and the man will go. That I think a woman to stop it from the onset where you have made your underground work and found out that this happened here and this is why the company or the, the industry is failing. 
and then finally you, you took up the challenges and then fix it up before then you have to write and they sign and you sign if i fix this up nobody is removing me i think we always underrate ourselves you know, nobody is removing me because i know what happened and i am now i have now fixed it so i'm going nowhere so coming to the aspect of what are we going to do all of us because it is not only the the, the, the people in government, not only the people in, in, in EOs or whatever, in companies and industry, it is all about all of us. Because why I say it's all about us, is we need to encourage women and girls in STEM. The society at large must have to do that. I tell you why. In my, but I don't want to waste time because I have several minutes. In my own days, far back, even before my own days, I noticed that what we, they regard women as um, people that are going to only be passive, not active in the society. And as such, they are not expected to take up uh, these causes that make them aggressive like men and that a, a woman, a girl should be seen but not heard. They are not so, so, supposed to be talking when the men are talking or when the boys are talking. That was the impression. And therefore, we label those subjects like... Uh, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, physics notwithstanding, is they call it male domain subjects. And you don't go near. That is a taboo for a woman to go and do math. So you behave like a man. No, it's not true. I took up that challenge and I said, I must read that physics. Let me see how I will, how I will behave like a mad person. It is not true. So the first thing is that we will have to encourage, encourage women and girls to take up STEM participate, re uh, register for STEM subjects, and then work in the STEM terms. By accepting that a woman is an individual in, a, in her own right and with her own peculiar qualities of mind, they don't accept that. People will have to decide for us. That she can equally participate and contribute significantly to the development of the nation through knowledge acquired from STEM. The society must have come to in agreement with this and try to accept us as that. STEM workshops, conferences, seminars, exhibition, television programs should often be mounted and conducted for women and girls in STEM. Guidance counseling is crucial for them. Scholarships, award, fellowships, and what have you should be suited for women and girls in STEM. And policymakers should involve women scientists, that is STEM, women in STEM, in drawing their policies in STEM. And thereby, we have to air exactly what we suit us to bridge the gap that has been created for long. And with that, if you see, if we, all these suggestions are implemented, then we, the result will be very positive and effective. And we will no longer be worrying about women going to into this term, using them and then dropping them. That is not, it's not human. And that is why we are not saying that we are fighting the men, no. But then let them recognize that a woman, as I have said, is, has his own right and with her own peculiar qualities of mind that can take decision on his or her own and that can be healed, she will equally participate in development of STEM and which will be give a long way for employment because you only employ what you have on ground, not what you don't have. If you don't have women studying this, how do you employ them? And if you ha still have that motion that women are to be heard and not seen, are to be seen and not heard, and they should not take courses that are very for, uh, meant for men, no course is meant for a man or a woman, my dear. It is how you feel, have to advise them and tell them, mentor them, monitor them, sensitize them. This subject, all these STEM subjects are for everybody. So I can tell you that we have to start from the grassroots. We don't just start crying when you now go to firm and you are not recognized or given the right position. We have to start from the scratch. Let's have them first. And when we have them, we know what to do with them. Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks, Mr. Okeke, for your motivational speech. I think that it's very useful for, especially for younger generation. So now I want to give a floor uh, to uh, um, Miss Mia, uh, the SEO of Girl Hype. What's an honor to give the floor for you, uh, especially uh, when I found out that you obtained to collect more than 900,000 uh, girls and women from all over the world and to bring them into your uh, huge project uh, since 2003, I guess. So, uh, Miss Me, I have a question for you. Can you please tell us more about your uh, company journey and strategies that you use to encourage uh, women uh, to develop a career in this technology sphere? Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, afternoon. Uh, I think it's afternoon here. Um, yeah, I started Girl Hype in 2003. And for me, it was not started because I had the luxury to start a company. I, it was the challenges that was faced in South Africa at the time. And for me, it, they met. Oh, now I can hear myself. For me, they meant I needed to do something about what was happening in the country. So I'll, I'll just give you a, bit, a little bit of a background about myself. I was born in Flagstop, and Flagstop is a mining area. So I grew up knowing about an engineer even when I was young as a girl. But I knew that I could never be one because those days in South Africa, South Africa's in economy was driven by the mining industry. The tech was moved found there was no Facebook and all these uh, tech companies. And because it was during apartheid time, I went to very poor schools. I came from um, a background that was really not, that had not pre prepared me for university. So even though I knew that as a woman, I could not participate in the economics of my country, not even because I'm a woman, by being black at the time, I couldn't participate in proper economical um, participation of the country that has to do with technical and more advanced careers. I had to sweat a lot to get there. Also, I knew that in the mines, they would only employ boys. So 80% of the time, there would be career days. And when we go to career days, when there's a section where people go for how to become an engineer, there will only be boys going there because I couldn't go there because I knew I would be employed in the mines. Um, but when I got to university, I discovered computers. And for me, it was the first time I touched it when I got there. When I learned how to code, it just gave me the confidence that I knew at the time that there's something about this thing that's going to be so big. Uh, that was like 19 years ago, almost 20 years next year. And I then decided, you know what, I'm going to start Girl Hype and I will focus in schools, black school uh, girls in South Africa. And black girls, because South Africa has challenges. And many people always ask me why black girls at the time and why tech. It wasn't a concept that was new in my head. I knew that as a black woman, I could never work in the mining industry. At the time, it had nothing to do with computers, but it had to do with technical knowledge. So there were a lot of technical jobs for engineers, for anything, anyone who could go to a technical college as a boy in my community would easily get a job. This is a community I grew in. So I knew then that there's something about a technical job, um, a job that comes from a STEM that gives someone opportunities in the economic space. And so when I learned to code, I found that, oh, wow, this is very easy and quicker for me to get into a technical job. So I then decided I'm gonna focus on black girls and I'll make sure that they gain the confidence to lead and the confidence to get into the tech space. And with the internet that I could see immediately that the internet is gonna be something big because, you know, I was, I would use internet to search information and I would only get global information. There was nothing about Africa or Africans and leaders and women. And I was politically conscious. So I knew that there's something wrong with this system that always tells me about 
other people's history except my own history. It wasn't enough documented. There wasn't enough content around it. So I then decided Girl Hype will focus on girls, especially black girls. And um, I was not going to beat around the bush. I started a company and I worked, I followed a triple P model where I approached corporates in South Africa and said, would you be interested in partnering with us to get the girls into um, studying STEM careers? And most of the companies at the time were not understanding what I'm talking about and why I'm talking about girls into going into technology. But the government was very quick. The South African government was very quick to catch up on it. And the universities at the time were building computer labs everywhere and schools were building computer labs, but they didn't know what to do with them. So I took advantage of that and said, can we have camps in these empty spaces? So I will take university students and uh, teach them how to code because by then I had already learned how to code for a short space of time. And um, we would run after school classes and after school camps for sc schools around Western Cape. Um, the word hackathon is very popular now. We've been doing that way before where we used to call them um, prototyping. Now they are called uh, hackathon, but we used to take high schools and we say to them, you're going to build a prototype and we'll teach you how to build a prototype or prototype on a computer. And you know, it, it became bigger because the school started approaching me because the teachers went, didn't know how to use computers themselves. And the teachers started saying, hey, can you teach us? Can you teach our schools? And within a short space of time, starting from one school, there was 20 schools. And um, it has always been free till this day. Our girls don't pay because they all come from poverty. And our oh, poverty or they were denied proper education, let me put it that way. And the, the other thing that we do is we provide them with um, all the necessities that they need to become a very strong, confident woman to lead, which is like public speaking courses, communication courses, how to read and write properly because English in South Africa is a business language. And if you didn't go to a good school in South Africa, you will struggle with reading and writing, which is English. And um, you know, the first 15 years was a nightmare because when I walked into the space, I found all white males. And uh, funny enough, the education system was very excited to see me. And these professors were very excited to teach me and show me the ropes because they were the ones that helping me write the curriculum of Gala Hype. I mean, the, the university students that I had recruited said, you know what, we don't know how to write coding curriculum, but what we'll do is we'll just take our first year curriculum and use it. And when I started approaching professors and said, can you edit it so that it's, it can be usable for high school students? And it just worked because, you know, sometimes you complicate things. This was a first year curriculum written for university students. And I started teaching it to nine years old and eight year old girls. And they mastered, they mastered those, that technical language of HTML, JavaScript, because what we were doing was we were doing repetitive knowledge. We would teach it and then they will come back for another camp and we will teach it again and then they will come back for another camp and then we will teach it again. So something that could have taken an, uh, someone who is in a first world country three months to learn. For us, it will take us um, maybe two years and purely because we were doing repetitive education because when they go back home, they don't have computers, they don't have access to internet, uh, but the knowledge, they will keep on remembering it. So when, we, when we, they come back, when we do these repetitive exercises, they, be, they master it because it's not the first time they see it. And so that was the first 15 years, which was a nightmare. Now this last five years has just become the best uh, years of our lives in, in globally. And I think for South Africa as such and for the world, we now have more partners. We have lots of corporates coming to the party and saying, yes, we want more women in tech. And that the word diversity and inclusion is, is big. Equity for women and girls is a word. Those days, there was no words. I was just running around saying, we need women. We need black women. And people didn't understand what I'm talking about. So now, fortunately, um, there's proper words like mentorship. At the time, I was saying, um, the girls can't be what they can't see. I mean, uh, I knew because I came from a mining 
just there were most engineers were boys, but because they could see other engineers around them, either their father was an engineer or the cousin they knew somewhere, or someone who came to our school to recruit uh, or programs in their space would be a man. And I used to say, but you cannot be what you can't see. I, I understood when I got to university that anybody can be an engineer. The engineering space is huge. It's not just in the mining industry. It's not just in the motor industry. And boys aspire to be something, but girls couldn't aspire to be anything. I accepted teacher or NS and I hated being those two things. So why was I confined to that? So only when I got to university, I saw options. So I said, why wouldn't we show girls these things before they make choices that are stagnating them? And um, yeah, fortunately now there's, the world is big, there's enough weight, there's weight like mentorship, sponsorship, people understand why we need women on the table. So we focus a lot on making sure that the girls have confidence to lead, even if they go in the tech space. And we very technical space, so we go technical knowledge, like coding, all the coding languages, including the no code languages, where we just teach them how to build platforms like your bubble. But we still go deep into teaching HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We teach them how to write Python, which is the biggest of our career. We want our girls to be part of writing AI. You know what? We can say whatever we want. This technical world is still very biased. The biases are living in our own brains. We carry them every day when we go to work, when we interact with people. And how are, what, now with the world building technology that we're still building the tools of AI, it's not officiated yet. P people are still testing it and they're testing it on a wrong data because most Africans don't contribute, don't have proper access to internet and they don't contribute well to the data. The ones who are contributing are from the academia side or the ones who know how to speak English. So most of the people who speak less language than English, we have, I can speak for South Africa, we have 11 languages, I don't know how many languages are in Africa, maybe there could be 2000 languages, native languages. So people are excluded and that's where we drawing our selective data to tell, to, you know, set our future. And for me, that's become one of my biggest thing. And so I'm at, IG, at Internet Governance Forum, making sure that the policies that are written are really inclusive. Inclusivity has always been my thing. Women and girls are my drive because of gender-based violence that we face as women um, in all fears of our life and in any aspect of where we come from. It doesn't matter whether you are white, whether you are black, or any race, any country, women still face those issues. So for me, those are, that's what I focus on to make sure that even these women as technically as empowered they are, they can take a space, they can lead, they can contribute towards policies and their voices on the table are the, is, is heard. So if you ask me about the journey of girl hype, the journey has been about, has been uh, morphing. It's been about we want to be technical. We want to learn the technical language. We want to participate in the tech space. We want to build technology. At the same time, we want to be included. And the only way we can do that is through confidence building, leadership building skills, and how to communicate and how to negotiate for yourself and how to make sure that in the end, the color of your skin is not relevant when you're sitting in the boardroom. Um, it, it might sound easy for someone who's not black, but if you've walked in a black skin and faced white men minimizing you most of the time, it becomes a serious issue. And when you're skilled and you've dealt with it and you, you've passed that phase, it's best you share it because we don't have enough role models in Africa. So that's in a nutshell what we do. Uh, thanks, Miss Mia, for your brief history of success. I guess you have added uh, um, some empowering and motivation to our audience here. So thank you for that. And uh, I guess we have uh, some time for questions. Don't we, Nisanur? Yeah, we have. And I also would like to say that I was quite uh, impressed by your own story. And I could also relate with mine as well, because there are different types of discriminations going on. 
and I could relate. Um, although my specialty is not STEM, uh, I was like quite inspired, I would say. Thank you for uh, sharing your own story. Thank you. Uh, so we have these open-ended questions as well for each one of you. Um, so, Ms. Riebe, maybe we can begin with you. If you had one piece of advice to young girls pursuing a career in STEM, what would that be? To believe in oneself, to know you can manage, to look for opportunities, and to look for the words of wisdom that will make it possible for you to grow manifold, lifelong learning, at all times seek to improve and upgrade your competence and your expertise, because what used to be relevant for production operations yesterday, today and tomorrow is no longer going to be on the cutting edge of technologies and science. And be inspired, find inspirational settings, media, and share this inspiration with other ladies to make sure that the rate of female students in STEM and the rate of women working in STEM-related areas is higher than it is today. Спасибо, Александр, за ваш ответ. So we have the second question for uh, Miss Okeke. Uh, I have a question especially for you. Uh, what inspires you and how do you see your mission? Well, um, as a child, I was inspired from my coming out from my primary school looking up into the sky. Most times I see the sky white. Other times I see it blue. I went into the class as small as I was. I asked, continue troubling my teacher. Why is it that teacher come out and say the sky is blue? Sometimes he emphatically told me that I, can, I couldn't give you this answer because I'm not a physicist. I kept worrying. At times you see the plane moving up the sky. I look into the sky, no road. I still ask inquisitively ask questions. The cars, the vehicles move on the road. Where is the road the plane is moving on? I say no answer. They told me that once I enter my secondary school, my physics teacher will tell me. I didn't, didn't wait for the teacher to, for me to get to class where physics is taught. I started asking the, the same question. So they now told me, you will get your answer as soon as you enter class three, junior class three. I was so anxious. The moment I entered, I asked questions and the physics teacher explained what I couldn't understand. So I started building my interest. So this physics, what is in it? Then I, after my school certificate, I made A1 in physics and the rest of them. I was now posted to as auxiliary teacher because I was not a trained teacher to go and teach physics in my secondary school. Most of them were older than I was. I was afraid to enter the class, the final year class. I went to the principal and said, no, I can't teach this class. I, I don't know what to teach them. He told me, teach them how you read physics and made one. I took up the challenge and I started teaching physics. Honestly, one day they gave me a very difficult problem from a school certificate piece of paper. I went home during the weekend, tried solving the problem I couldn't. I went to nearby secondary school from my father's house to get the graduate teachers to help me solve. They couldn't. I didn't sleep until the wee hour of the Sunday night, I remember. I got solution to this. My screening woke up my sleeping father. He came into the my room rushing. What is it? I said, Papa, I have solved this disturbing problem in physics. And I was planning to be a medical doctor. I told him, Papa, from today, I'm going to be a physicist. He said, carry on, my daughter, go ahead and, be, and do what you want to do. So that was the first insight of me to become a physicist. So when I got married, because I married early, I did after my school certificate, I still said, I must read these physicists. Then telling my, my husband, was a, he's a physicist, but astrophysicist. So I now took in France and gained admission to the university and read physics. 
for four years. We were only two leads in a class of 31. Uh, you can see 29 male and two female. We graduated with. I, I graduated as the best three students, made a very good grade, and they called me back to become a lecturer in physics. So you can see this physics, if you have love for physics, and that is why from when I'm mentoring people in physics, I don't look back. When I was in a Washington, in a, um, Morgan State University, three months research leave, after my, uh, before the end of my research leave, they asked me to give a talk in the faculty so that this year, the girls will now love physics. I did that. And most of them came into my office. They were requesting me, please, to continue. I said, no, I have people to train in my country, Nigeria. And I came back. And that I did the same in Japan. I didn't want to start. I want to get that knowledge and then pass it on to others. And I'm happy. I have mentored so many ladies in physics, professors, even not ladies, men, men and women alike. So what I have done is mentoring them, sensitizing them, giving them role model of how to become a physicist, especially when I won the Laurie UNESCO Award for Women in Science for Physical Science in 2013. We were in France and that gave me the zeal, more zeal to mentor more students, to get more students, to get more females into the, into the field of STEM. And I'm happy, I'm proud. Many of them are doing the same. I was so intrigued when I went for a conference and somebody was praising one of my my former student who is now a professor, that he was mentoring her in a way that he did, she did not expect. And when he asked her, she said, my mentor, Professor Ethan Ogeke, did the same to me, so I have to do it to, to, to you. Then I and I'm told again, you have to continue. Don't break the cycle so that it will continue. And then by so doing, we get so many, we are going to get many females into STEM. And that we solve our problem of gender parity, gender, eh, 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 uh, whatever gap. Because once we have them on ground, Lord, when you are there, try to get a qualified female like you to replace you. I don't say get people that are not qualified, get those that are qualified. Mark the word, because I don't encourage people that don't know anything. You can't put them there because that they know. Mentor them in a way that when they do things, they will get back to you and say, this is what you taught us. So I think uh, because of time, I don't need to go into detail because I know with this, my position, many people have aspire, are aspiring and have aspired and doing, in fact, I pray they do more than what I have done. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks. In conclusion, I would like to say that it was a pleasure for me to hear your opinions, your life passes, especially uh, the successful women in uh, STEM, uh, in a such field as uh, technology and educational spheres. So thank you for that. Thank you very much.